Uh, she hasn't heard it before. She'll ask me what book I've been reading lately. <laughs> Uh, not quite. She's very supportive, and I'm very grateful for her support. And nice to have my colleagues here, and Ben and Ruth. They are from the uh, a different department in our work, but also Howard. Howard, where are you uh, seated? There you are, Howard. Good to have you. He's our Asia Pacific Director. And is Tracy here this morning? Tracy, there you are. Please stand up. Tracy Trinita, nice to have you. Tracy's life was in the modeling career. That's only because I turned it down. She took on that modeling job. And she hails from Bali in Indonesia and one of our great apologists. The team actually has about 45 apologists placed in about 12 countries. And uh, they are scattered all over. And uh, Howard Abe, uh, originally in the business world, left that business world a few years ago to join our team, took the Oxford program and I think has just recently moved from Shanghai to Taipei. Or this month, he'll be doing that move. He and his wife, Olivia, have a lovely baby. And uh, he's going to direct our work uh, from Taipei, Taiwan. He's got a great team in Asia Pacific. And Michael gets there often enough to help out. Our Oxford uh, European team is just fully involved there. Michael is actually our international director and has taken the big load of leadership of my shoulders, and he leads the team globally. I really don't know how he does it. He's all over the map, and he's either, wherever I go, he's either coming in next week or has just left. Uh, he's also got a young family, so pray for him. It's an enormous responsibility to be an itinerant and also to be a good husband and a family man or a good wife and a family person. We have several women apologists on our team, Amy Orr Ewing, Margaret Manning, Michelle Tepper, uh, Sharon Dirks. Uh, we've also got Joe Vitale, who has recently joined several of them. And they are here having a tremendous impact at a time such as this. Uh, it is my privilege to be speaking to you today on this uh, important theme of the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. I've written quite a bit on it, and my most recent book was with my colleague Vince uh, Vitale, but that was on the theme of suffering. But prior to that, I penned the book, Why Jesus? And now my, my colleague, uh, Nabil Qureshi, I don't know if you have heard Nabil, a remarkable apologist. He's doing his PhD work at Oxford University. Nabil is actually an MD by training and profession and has a couple of postgraduate degrees in New Testament studies from Duke, from Abiola, now doing his doctoral work at Oxford in uh, the text of the New Testament. Uh, Nabil just approached me a few weeks ago and asked if I would author a book with him on looking at Jesus through Eastern eyes. Now, of course, Kenneth Bailey has done a lifetime work on looking at Jesus through Middle Eastern eyes. I don't think that book can ever be excelled. Uh, Nabil comes from Pakistan. I hail from India. And he just said, Ravi, our way of looking at the person of Christ because of our inheritance in the East is uh, very unique at times. Could we just take every passage of Scripture where Jesus is speaking and take a look at it as to how through Eastern eyes we see those texts and see the person of Jesus Christ. So he and I are working on that book right now. What I want to bring to you is uh, a, a standard approach that I take in this, uh, I don't think I have put this part of it in print, Jesus Among Other Gods, if you have seen that book, is the answers of Jesus to seven questions that no other claimant to divine or prophetic status would have ever answered on those same terms. Uh, that is the book entitled Jesus Among Other Gods. And uh, by God's grace, it's done really well in the marketplace. Uh, it's a book that moved me deeply when I penned it. This particular talk I give comes to it from an existential viewpoint. What do I mean by that? Follow me very carefully now. The most important question in life is the question of truth. Not of feeling, not of enjoyment, not even really of how I am going through some ordeal of pain, however real that may be. At the bottom line of all of these issues is the question, what is the truth about life itself? That's the one question you and I need to be engaged in from the time we can deal with reality as it impinges upon our senses and upon our thinking. Those inescapable, haunting questions that come has to be reduced to the bottom line. What is the truth? 
And that's why when Pilate looked at Jesus and said, what is truth? And audaciously turned and walked away without waiting for the answer. It's an incredible portrayal of how often we can ask the right question, but never pause to really engage the answer. I'm trying to remember who I was talking to very recently in one of my previous stops on the, in the last four weeks. And they were talking to me about searching for the truth. Uh, and I said to them, are you sincere in your search? Are you sincere in your search? My colleague Sanj Kalra always points this out. If you are genuine in your search, I can find out that genuineness by asking you what you're reading or what you're listening to in pursuit of that answer. I think it's a great thought that Sanj plants in people's minds. So I use that question to this person. I said, are you genuine in your search? If you're genuine, tell me what it is you're reading or what it is you're listening to to find the answer. So that's one, the search for truth. Now we go to number two. There are two theories of truth, the correspondence theory and the coherence theory. Every court of law that is honest in its pursuit of finding the truth brings to the foreground these two theories of truth. Correspondence deals with particular assertions if they correspond to reality. Were you at that place at such and such a time? They are looking for a correspondence of the truth to the answer that you give. That's the correspondence theory. But when all of your answers are given, they are looking for coherence. Do these answers all cohere? Do they come together or are there points of tension? And is there a contradiction between some of your answers that you have given previously? Number one, truth. Number two, two theories of truth, correspondence and coherence. Number three, how do you test the truth? Philosophers have basically given three responses, logical consistency, empirical adequacy, and experiential relevance. Are these answers logically consistent? Is there an empirical way of verifying what these answers are asserting? And number three, it is relevance to the whole issue that is at hand. So you've come from one truth, two correspondence coherence, three logical consistency, empirical adequacy, experiential relevance. Now you come to four. What are the questions to which you're looking for the answers in your worldview? Four, origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Where do you come from? What gives life meaning? How do I differentiate between good and bad? What happens to a human being when he or she dies? These are the four questions that actually are either smuggled in or openly accepted by you in your worldview. The lens through which you look at reality answers these four questions. So you can go back, four, three, two, one. And I won't belabor it any further, but you can go to five, and that is the five disciplines that you have to bring to bear in your research, ranging from epistemology, how do I know something to be true, to anthropology, how do I define what it means to be human, to ethics, how do I come to my ethical theories? And of course, you've got cosmology and theology and all of them in there. There are five distinctive disciplines that have to be pursued in order to get to the fundamental question of the truth. It's not easy. It's not an easy pursuit. John chapter 18, read, reading from verse 33. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Notice the politicization of the question and the ethnic tension he brings in. Because here's a Roman representing the Caesars looking at Jesus and the Jewish audience in the backdrop here. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus looks at him in an incredible question and says, is that your own idea or did others talk to you about me? 
Intent is always prior to content. It was George MacDonald who said, to give truth to him who loves it not is to only give him more multiplied reasons for misinterpretation. To give truth to him who loves it not is only to give him more multiplied reasons for misinterpretation. If you're genuinely not in search of the truth, every answer is going to have a comeback from you because you're going to be chasing rabbit trails all the time to get away from the central question and the central answers that are being given. Is that your own idea or did others uh, talk to you about it? Listen to what he says, am I a Jew? It was your people, your chief priests, who handed you over to me. What is it you've done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. Ah, you are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you're right in saying I'm a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth, Pilate asked. With this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I have no basis for a charge against him. The truthfulness of the charge was dealt with. The truthfulness of the person was still left unaddressed. Remarkable. And Pontius Pilate becomes the only, quote, heathen name in the famous creeds. Tried and suffered under Pontius Pilate. For years and years, archaeologists said, we've never found this name in all of our research. Today, if you go to Caesarea, you'll see a huge stone discovered some years ago, and the mention of Pontius Pilate on it, and uh, as he represented Rome in probably the most difficult encounter any human being had ever had, coming face to face with a claimant to one who said he was the ultimate truth. You know, the fascinating thing about the person of Jesus Christ is how he waited for the question to be genuine. And time and time again, the disingenuousness of the questioner was revealed. If you go to Mark 14, for example, you see him claiming when the high priests look at him and ask him if he is the Christ, the son of the living God, and he said, I am at which they began to tear apart their robes and wanted and said, what more evidence do we need? In chapter 8 of the Gospel of John, where the crowd has gathered in front of him, they say, you knew Abraham, even though Abraham lived so long ago, and Jesus borrowed the title which was reserved for Yahweh alone. And he said, before Abraham was, I am. And that's when they went after the stones and wanted to go after him. It's a remarkable thing of how clearly he revealed himself. And even to, to uh, Peter in Matthew 16, he said, who do you say that I am? He said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Simon, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. The genuine seeker after truth finds the affirmation from God himself to reveal to you who this person of Jesus Christ is. And I want you to know this morning as you are here, your entire life and the choices you make defines on what you have done with Jesus. All of your choices. I'm not saying you will always be consistent, but you will certainly treat his person and his finished work as Calvary as either that ever-present reality with which you make the decisions or that haunting inescapability when you make the wrong decisions to realize you're walking away from him whom you have dealt with or affirmed in some way as the Christ, the Son of the living God. And now, 2,000 years later, his name still stands writ large in history. 
This is what F. F. Bruce says, the great New Testament scholar. He says, the, he says referring to W. E. H. Lecky, the French historian who was a skeptic. On the heels of Lecky's comment, Bruce says the following statement, but let me give you Lecky's comment first. The character of Jesus has not only been the highest pattern of virtue, but the strongest incentive in its practice, and has exerted so deep an influence that it may be truly said that the simple record of three three short years of active life has done more to regenerate and to soften mankind than all the disquisitions of philosophers and all the exhortations of moralists. Uh, W.E.H. Lecky, a history of European morals uh, from Augustus to Charlemagne. I may be off, Lecky may have been an Irish historian, somebody can correct me on that. But here's Bruce's comment. That is a non-Christian or at least not a distinctly Christian judgment of one sense in which Jesus is not only a historical figure, but also our eternal contemporary, his influence lives on. Let me repeat that. That is a non-Christian or at least not distinctly Christian judgment of one sense in which Jesus is not only a historical figure, but also our internal contemporary, his influence lives on. I wanna give you one more word of introduction here. Mark has 661 verses, Six, over 600 of them are in Matthew and over 300 of them in Luke. So there's a coalescing of the story in the gospel writers and the key aspects of it, even though a couple of them miss out on the birth narrative and a couple of them even leave out the Sermon on the Mount, all of them have a vital part of the passion of our Lord included in the narrative. John, I think over 50% of his entire narrative takes us to the path of Calvary. With that as a background, let me give you the reasons I see existentially and experientially why his answers are true and truthful. Number one, his description of the human condition. His description of your heart and my heart is so accurate and so conforms to reality. You know, uh, I won't name the country, but I was in that one of those countries just a few days ago. And I went to visit in a prison a senator who is now serving term, a prison term for certain charges of corruption. And you know, it's a sad thing when you see a man of such high stature at one time in power, now behind prison bars. And I was having a, a meal with him and then he said, before you go, can I invite 10 or 12 others here so that you can speak to them and pray with them. And he, 12 other men came. Two of them were military generals, former generals. Some of them senators, some of them congressmen. I, I leave places like that with my heart just shattered. You know, I say, what's going on? You know, you walk away past all the check gates and pick up your driver's license again and you get into the car and you think to yourself, somebody's father is gonna be there for many years to come. Somebody's brother, somebody's son. These boys were high placed men, but got into the trap of how power corrupts and tends to corrupt absolutely. And they were now serving prison terms. The white collar crime in our time, all over the world, how people are cheated, lied to, abused, D, it was Dale Moody who said, if a man is stealing nuts and bolts from a railway track and you send him to college to get an education, at the end of his education, he will steal the whole railway track. <laughs> there are people in power today, and one man in one country said to me, I don't know whether he's right or not, but he certainly made his point. He said, when you get to the top in my profession, you've already proved that you have compromised your conviction several times along the way. It's sad if it's true, even if it comes near to the truth, that truthfulness doesn't really get you to lead a people 
conniving and scheming and manipulation and deceit gets you into the place of power. And if you end up there with all that power and you've already compromised your convictions, what else are you going to do along the way? Does deceit and does untruthfulness become your daily fodder in leading the masses and leading the people? It's a horrible reality, but what is it that Jesus says? The heart is desperately wicked above all things. That he's talking about your heart and he's talking about my heart. We don't need to look at a wide array. We don't add oftentimes, even though I point to the Hitlers and the Stalins and uh, the, uh, the Mussolinis and all, and all of the havoc they have wreaked in history. The truth of the matter is temptation boils down to three issues. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, greed, pride of life. Lust, greed, and pride. These are the three areas that are facing us every day. Genesis 1 to 3 is often the most disputed passage by the skeptic, and yet it is the one most lived out every day in our lives. Has God really spoken? Did God really mean it? Why don't you do it your way? That's what happens every day in your life and mine. And so when Jesus describes the human condition as sinful and desperately wicked above all things, he is truly describing your heart and mine. And I think the reality has to come home to this. You and I don't like it. Other worldviews struggle with it. The, 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 the moralist who is an atheist chafes under this. The surest way you can cut an interview short on any media network is if they are asking you what's the problem and you use the word sin. Yeah, same old thing. You know, these boys all tell us the same thing. You know, sin, sin, sin. I was doing a session at Johns Hopkins University on what does it mean to be human. And at the end of it, one lady stood up and was really irate and was angry with me because I said the human heart is depraved. And the louder she shouted, the more she was really proving my point. <laughs> it's true, you know, uh, my, my good friend Prakash Yasudian from India, who's passed away now in, uh, last year, great colleague and one of the first of our team to be called home by our Lord. And Prakash had a typical Indian sense of humor. And uh, he was telling me of this uh, little boy, this young boy in school in India who was suspended for stealing. And so the father went to see the principal and said, what is my boy stealing? He said, ah, oh, pencils, paper clips, erasers, you know, and uh, paper and all this, and the pens. And the father said, I don't understand why he would steal any of this stuff. I can bring it from my place of work. Why is he stealing it here? <laughs> <clears throat> My goodness. With the Indian that really resonated, I'm disappointed that it resonates with the Aussies as well, you know. We all do the same things, you know. The vice president of the J.C. Penney Company used to be uh, uh, the chairman of our board, Warren Wilkin. I remember him one day saying when they caught a guy for stealing stuff, he said, this company is not owned by a person. I'm not stealing from a person. So he said, I took him out and I said, do you see the name on there? It said J.C. Penney. That's the name of a person. There are investors. There are people here who have to give account. You are stealing from a person. Imagine a statement like that. I'm not stealing from a person. So I'm stealing from a company, you know. The same person would be very upset if he wanted to talk to a person about his job. So go and talk to the company, you know, don't talk to a person. That's the reality in our hearts. We actually do things and justify it. And so one of the great discoveries you can make in your life, the great discovery is to recognize you're a sinner. Sin has two dimensions to it. There's a verticality to it. There is a horizontalness to it. But the Bible is so beautiful in the way it describes it. Sin is not even so much a choice as much as it is a condition where we fall short of the glory of God. We miss the mark. I think it was Donald Gray Barnhouse who said when he walked into his kitchen one day and saw his little girl on a stool leaning over to get a cookie from the cookie jar. 
And as he walked in, she caught a glimpse of him with the corner of her eye. And so rather than reach all the way to the cookie jar, she put out the other hand and pretended to be conducting a choir. <laughs> From reaching out to a cookie that didn't belong to her to the glorious calling of a choir director. You know, how do you get upset with a child who's leading a choir? Yeah. We cover it up, we cover our tracks. Jesus was so right. Your heart is sinful, so is mine. Take a look at our world today and what's happening. Take a look at our world today. I was in Syria a few years ago, and the chief of intelligence in his office said to me, stay away from the politics of the region. I said, I will, sir. But will you tell me one thing? How do you describe what is happening here? This is before all Bedlam had broken loose. Here's what he said to me. He said, Mr. Zacharias, I give this part of the world no more than five years, and it's all going to blow up in our faces here. He was one of the first to be assassinated. One of the first to be assassinated. He was gone. The sinful heart that we see today the ruthless beheadings, the extermination of Christians that's going on in the Middle East. We are remaining silent while thousands of them are being wiped out. That is the goal of some of these extremists. If the reverse were taking true, that were, were, were true, I can assure you many a leader in the world would be screaming out at what is happening. In Lebanon, so many of them were wiped out. Now in Syria, they're being wiped out from village to village, from town to town. Christianity is being de decimated. One actor in England in a recent interview last week made the comment, isn't anybody going to say anything as to what is going on in the Middle East, the wiping out of Christendom out there? The sinfulness of the heart of man. But secondly, Jesus gives us a remarkable answer for the sinfulness of the human condition. And I think this is probably so unique and so powerful as we read what the gospel really has to say to us. That is what the gospel is about. Matthew and Mark, one third of their portions on the cross. Luke, quarter of his gospel on the cross. John, half of his gospel on the cross. This is what the gospel is about. It is the good news of the provision of the grace of God through his son, Jesus Christ, offering you and me forgiveness and redemption. This is the gospel. A great speaker, a great name among speakers in America, Probably the largest church in the country wrote a book called Your Best Life Now. And somebody asked me, what do I think of the book? I said, it is amazing to me, as thick as the book is, there's not one mention of the cross and the atonement. Not one mention of it. Can you really have your best, sorry, sorry, it's called Your Best Life Now. Can you really have your best life without understanding what the gospel message is about? This is precisely what Luther struggled over when the church had become a business, when the church was selling salvation, when the church was controlling the guilt component in your life and mine. And he struggled and struggled and said, is this what I need to do in order to get my forgiveness, in order to get, get my salvation? And so the Reformation cry became sola gracia by grace alone, sola scriptura, the scriptures alone, sola fide, by faith alone, by faith, by grace, and through the scriptures. If you were to look at any other worldview, and I'm not meaning this to be condemning, I'm meaning this to be differentiating, and you can check it out with them. If you ask a devout Muslim, how do you make it to paradise? Here is their answer. Your good deeds will have to outweigh your bad deeds. You will be weighed in the balances, as it were. A man from Iraq said to me, I walk to the farthest mosque on Fridays and I count my steps. 
because I know how rotten I've been the rest of the week. I'm hoping by taking all these steps and walking all this distance, I was hoping that I would outweigh all of my bad deeds and gain some merit and gain some points. It was actually in Toowoomba some years ago where I was doing a debate with a humanist and an Islamic scholar and the question of heaven and hell came up and that was his answer. You wait out. You're measured. And if you ask them, you ask the pantheist, your karma, your karma, every birth is a rebirth. Every life is a payment for a previous life. And look at Jesus Christ, and he sees a woman with the alabaster ointment, wiping his feet and washing his feet, and he says to the skeptics out there, to the religious, he said, you know what? Who would love you more? One who's been in debt for 500 or one who's been in debt for 50? And they have a bad or ready answer. They said 500. They said, you're looking at her. And then he paid her the greatest compliment. He said, wherever the gospel is preached, there shall this also be told, the story of what this woman has done to me. She came to him and he never resisted, never blocked her. He knew her heart and she knew his heart that she would be forgiven and received and accepted. Like the school teacher writes, he came to my desk with a quivering lip, the lesson was done. Have you a new sheet for me, dear teacher? I've spoiled this one. I took his sheet all soiled and blotted and gave him a new one all unspotted. And into his tired heart I cried, do better now, my child. I went to the throne with a trembling heart, the day was done. Have you a new day for me, dear master? I've spoiled this one. He took my day all soiled and blotted, gave me a new one all unspotted. And into my tired heart he cried, do better now, my child. When I was in Mumbai, India, a few weeks ago with some of my colleagues at this beautiful Taj Mahal Hotel, just the upper crust of the society was invited there. A few years ago, it would be very tough to even talk about the gospel, but India is so gently opening up. And in the Q&A time, one of the well-known businessmen there stood up and said, Dr. Ravi, he said, my wife and I have a disagreement. The moment somebody begins like that, I want to say, why are you bringing me into it? <laughs> and he said, she believes a guru is necessary. I'm not sure. Is a guru necessary? And I said, oh my, you know. So I said, you know what, sir? Because of the way you've phrased it, you've made it easier to answer. You've asked me, is a guru necessary? What is necessary? is that which meets your greatest need. And your greatest need is not for a guru. Your greatest need is for a savior. A savior is necessary. And even your guru needs a savior. <laughs> and that savior is in Jesus Christ. And at the end of that breakfast meeting, he comes right up to the front and he grabs my hand and he said, thank you so much for being honest with your answer. I have a lot to think about this because I expanded on why that saving grace of Jesus Christ is the answer. You cannot ultimately pay. One of my Hindu friends in um, Atlanta used to bother me every week and would take hour and hour and hour. You know, in India we go around in circles. When you arrive, you say namaste. When you're leaving, you say namaste. You don't know whether you're coming or going. It's the same <laughs> greeting. And so he would come every Sunday and be with me for hours. And Margie, my wife, would say, my wife's from Canada. And they have a very subtle sense of humor in Canada. And she said to me, you know what? I've been listening to this for so many weeks. Aren't these the same questions he asked last Sunday? I said, yeah. She said, am I missing something? I said, yes, you're missing my culture. We just do this again and again and again. She said, are you wasting your time? I said, no. I said, all of a sudden the light, the light of the Lord will shine in. And so one day he comes to me and uh, with his wife and they are, they are answering, I'm answering the same questions again and again. And he says, Ravi Ji, I'm ready. This guy is a computer programmer. I said, really? He said, yes. I said, so you want me to pray with you now and go through the Bible and all? She said, Anurag, I will do it with you on one condition. We go straight back home and tell our parents what we've done. 
He said, no, no, why do you make me all, make all these promises and all of that? So he said, Raviji, I'm not ready right now. I'll come back later. <laughs> he, they both came back the next Sunday and uh, we had the privilege of praying. I said, what did it? He said, two questions. I said, what is that? He said, Raviji, he said, you know, when I borrow from the bank, which I do as a businessman, they at least tell me two things, how much I owe and how much time I have to pay it. I said, that's true. He said, then karma, I don't know either. I don't know how much I owe. I don't know how many lives I need to live in order to pay it. I said, good thinking, Anurag, very good thinking. <laughs> and then he said, then a question you asked me last time. I said, what was that? He said, if you can't start from now and go backwards, you've had a finite number of births. I said, that's right, I told you that. He said, then you said to me, if you've had a finite number of births, then every birth is not a rebirth because you've had a first birth. If you've had a first birth, what were you paying for on that birth? <laughs> I said, Anurag, you're thinking very clearly now. <laughs> they bowed their heads and gave their lives to Jesus Christ in our home. The cross, there's a beauty to it. There's a sublimity to it. There's a comprehensiveness to it. There's a redemptive factor to it. I came to know Christ on a bed of suicide. God gave me a new heart. The description of the condition, the provision for my malady. Thirdly and quickly, his equipment in suffering. There are several points here. I'll skip over some of them, but I'll get to this one because this is such an important one in all of our lives. And you know, listening to a gentleman of the loss of his wife, it's the easy part, isn't it? to talk about it, but who knows the loneliness and the sadness night after night in his life when you've been accustomed to having your spouse by your side for all those years and now there's a missing spot in the home. I nearly lost my wife when we were in our 20s. She had an ectopic pregnancy, we were on the highway and she, when I, by the time I got her to the hospital she was only 28 at that time. She'd lost 60% of her blood. And the doctor kept me in the waiting room. He said, you're not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. You're standing right here. He said, I can't tell you what's going to happen. But in his words, he said, we've got a belly full of blood. And I was out there thinking, you know, Margie's 28. Is this night going to end with that kind of a story? When you respond to a calling like this, your spouse has to be twice as committed as you are to withstand the lonely hours. By God's grace, that surgeon was a brilliant surgeon. God used him and she was brought through and came through. But even those, my, my brother's a surgeon in Canada. And when he found out, he phoned me and said, Ravi, he said, get on your knees and thank God because that's one of the highest mortality emergencies that ever comes in. Because most of the, almost often, if they don't know they're pregnant, they really don't know what's happening. They just fade into a shock and they lie in bed while the body is literally shedding all its blood and life goes out from within them. Malcolm Mugridge wrote this. Contrary to what might be expected, I look back on experiences that at that time seemed very desolating and painful. I look upon them with particular satisfaction. Indeed, I can say with complete truthfulness that everything I've learned in my 75 years in this world and everything that truly enhances and enlightened my existence has been through affliction and not through happiness whether pursued or attained. In other words, if it were ever to be made possible to eliminate affliction from our earthly existence by means of some drug or other medical mumbo jumbo, the result would not be to make life more delect delectable but to make it to banal and trivial, to be endurable. This, of course, is what the cross signifies, and it is the cross of Jesus Christ more than anything else that has called me inexorably to Jesus Christ. He says, every time I stand outside a church and look at a cross, I say to myself, that is what has drawn me to my Savior. Life becomes too trivial and too banal if you don't understand the heinousness of sin and the marvelousness of forgiveness and God's grace. Some of the greatest places to share the gospel is in prisons. 
But how does one move to this point that Muggeridge has talked about? It is only as you stay focused on the cross, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also has exalted him and given to him a name that is above every name, that of the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That was the earliest hymn sung by the Christians. Now, I want to stop for just a moment. Listen to me very carefully. The Apostle Paul came to Jesus in a reverse order to the rest of the disciples. When they first saw Jesus, they said, where do you live? The early disciples, they want to know what his home was. Where did he come from? Typical in Eastern question, where do you live? Because that's going to tell me a lot about you, your street address. Paul came the reverse. He looked at the resurrected Christ, and that's why he said that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. Chronologically, the other disciples had come the right way. Logically, Paul came from the resurrection motif, but he said, I want to understand the cross. That's what was a stumbling block to him that I may know him and the fellowship of his suffering. That's why he said, henceforth let no man trouble me. I bear on my body the marks of the Lord. I desire to know nothing amongst men save Jesus Christ and him crucified. The gospel story in that crucifixion reminds us of the suffering that he went through, which he chose for the joy that was set before him. And so ladies and gentlemen, Pain and suffering is a reality, and God conquers not in spite of the dark mystery of suffering. He conquers through it. So said James Stewart of Scotland. And fourthly, and quickly, the embodiment of the ideal. For the Hebrews, the ideal was light. For the Greeks, it was knowledge. For the Romans, it was glory. Light, knowledge, glory. Paul says, God who caused the light to shine out of darkness has caused his light to shine in our hearts to give to us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus our Lord. Light, knowledge, glory shining upon the face of a person. In him coalesced all of the ultimate abstractions of pursuits in the embodiment of the life of Jesus Christ. The perfection of of our Lord. That's why I said, which of you convinces me of any sin? And the last thing I say to you is his resurrection from the dead. Anthony Flew was the preeminent atheistic philosopher of the 80s and the 90s. His argument against verification and order was so powerful and so strong, he believed he needed to say nothing more to prove his atheism. But somewhere in the last 10 years, he had a change of heart. And atheistic scholars were stunned when Flew said he no longer could be a consistent atheist. He was still not sure about immortality, but he pointed to two people, the writings of C.S. Lewis, from years gone by, and the current writer N.T. Wright. And he made the comment, if there is anything that meaningfully addresses immortality, he says it has to be the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He said, outside of that, I have no other things to point to. It was uh, Conrad Adenauer, after the war, who invited Billy Graham into his chambers. And he said, Mr. Graham, do you believe Jesus Christ really rose again from the dead? And Billy Graham said, Mr. Adenauer, if I didn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I would have no gospel left to be preached. And Adenauer paused, and Billy Graham told us around the luncheon table years ago, he said, he said, Mr. Graham, outside of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I know of no other hope for mankind. Outside of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I know of no other hope for mankind. Let me just take three conversions for you in a minute. Thomas, I'm not going to believe until I see. 
And then when he did, ho kure osmu, ho the osmu, my Lord and my God. And he goes to India to preach the gospel and paid with his life. Saul of Tarsus to Paul, who gave to us one third of the New Testament. Saul was looking after the clothes of those who were stoning Stephen. Later on, he didn't realize he was going to be carrying the message all the way to the Caesars and to the Gentile world and the conversion of James, the brother of Jesus, who became the head of the church. Those three conversions alone, pretty dramatic because they changed history and all else followed after that. The message of the gospel was taken to the Western world. The message of the gospel was taken to the Eastern world. And today, more knees bend at the name of Jesus and by the way, when people name one other religion and say it's the fastest growing religion in the world, don't you believe it? It's the fastest growing enforced religion in the world. You give people the freedom to believe or disbelieve, you'll find out that particular religion is not the fastest growing religion in the world. Thousands, if not millions, will turn their back upon it. Out of the freedom to believe and disbelieve, the Christian faith still boasts a large number as millions have bent their knees from Augustine of old all the way down today to my own family's conversion, which came in that we were the, my, my ancestors were from the Nambudris, the highest caste of the Hindu priesthood from the deep south in Kerala. My grand aunt, when she was 103, was telling the story to my wife and me. And it came about by a servant in the house who was cleaning the home, who heard the gospel and gave her heart to Jesus Christ. Think about that. If I'm not mistaken, it was a maid in the Wesley home that reached Charles for the Lord as well. From the Augustines and Luthers and Calvins to people ordinarily with a dust rag in their hand making a living. The gospel is for all of us. Do you know him today? He is the truth with relevance. Bow your head with me in prayer. <coughs> <clears throat> Heavenly Father, move through this audience this morning and let there be those who will turn to you. And ladies and gentlemen, our heads are bowed. I've not planned on doing this. I'll have to do it in a quick 30, 45 seconds. If God has spoken to you today and you know you need to turn your life over to Jesus Christ, will you do that? Just surrender your life to him, invite him as your savior. I'm gonna look across this audience, just quickly raise your hand up, put it down. I will remember you in prayer.